Coming up, Jesus gets some pussy, Catholic men get pushy, and hell sounds, well, kind of whooshy. Plus, and I know this will come as a gigantic shock, we're probably drunk. Meet us at the corner of 36 and Prospect for this gooey episode of Kiss the Goat. My name is Axe, and this is Kiss, Kiss the, the Goat. Goat. Surprise, motherfuckers, we're back! The midnight bells are ringing, and the creaking wooden doors of the dark church have swung open wide. Heed the call, acolytes. The candles are bleeding, the robes are long and flowing, and I think Stephanie made some coffee. Regular and decaf. Let the sense of impending doom surround you. Well, not. Doom, that sounds so serious. Well, this is a show about devil movies, and we're not going to be serious? Hey, look, you can be serious. I'm going to be drunk here in a few minutes. <laughs> I mean, you make that decision as an autonomous being, but... Oh, no, no, no. I'm not too far behind you on the drunk part. Hey, if this is the first time that you're listening to Kiss the Goat, this this is pretty much it we have a few drinks <laughs> yeah sometimes more than a few and we talk about satanic cinema and comparative religions and whatever else drifts through our transom and if you're not down with that we got two words for you don't listen yeah stop listening i mean i'm sure there are nicer podcasts out there with people you've heard of talking about current events using inspirational quotes that's not us no, we don't do that. In the meantime, this is, finally, episode 50 of Kiss the Goat, and welcome to it. Is it actually episode 50? Yeah, I think it is, but I also think that there are some episodes I can't find. Like, I sort of half remember doing a show about The Last Exorcism, and I mentioned in an old episode that we covered The Last Exorcism, but I can't find it anywhere. Well, did you mean the exorcism of Emily Rose, maybe? Because we did cover that. <laughs> Darling, I think I know the difference between The Last Exorcism and The Exorcism of Emily Rose. So one of those movies is good. I liked Emily Rose. I know. Well, until we can find irrefutable proof that we did cover The Last Exorcism, I guess we'll just talk about the first exorcism. Well, one of the first. Later on in movie time, we'll talk about the 1973 William Friedkin classic, The Exorcist. Right now, please enjoy these commercials. Oh, um, we don't have any commercials. <laughs> oh, yeah. We dropped this episode without any real warning, and we don't have any adverts. So what the hell are we going to do next? I think it's time to debut a new segment here on Kiss the Goat. Hey, hey, hey. Now, I am not taking my clothes off at the Christian bookstore again. That was a disaster. You tried to rub one out on a large print King James Bible. When did you do that? It was... Wait, you don't remember that? I do not think I was there for that. Besides, that wouldn't completely work on an audio program. Well, I don't know. It got pretty loud. <laughs> Imagine, hey, Acolytes, it's time for a ridiculous segment we like to call The Devil is in the Details. Yay! 
Yeah, it's sort of like Satan 101. You know, you never know what we'll throw into the mix. Urban legends, outrageous comments, the occasional exorcism, just kind of a mishmash of whatever catches our evil eyes. So we're going way back with this one as we attempt to answer the question, what does hell sound like? So back in the heady days of the 20th century, a rumor started circulating that Russian miners looking for it's like, I don't know, vodka? Are there vodka wells? Just springs of vodka running through the earth. <laughs> I hope so. But the story goes that the miners drilled so deep into the earth that they accidentally pounded through the ceiling of hell. And then someone dropped a demon-proof microphone into the hole and recorded the sounds of hell. The soundtrack of eternal suffering. The piteous noises of the suffering damned. And it goes a little like this. Jeez, that sounds familiar. It sounds like dozens of people trying to use the gold embossed spine of a large print King James Bible to rub one out. You're not funny. Now, according to the urban legend surrounding this well to hell, people fucking believe this shit. They honestly thought that A, hell was in the center of the earth, and B, that this was the actual ambiance of the underworld. It's not. I didn't even know that some people believed hell was in the center of the earth until literally last week. And it makes a rudimentary kind of sense since the middle of the earth is molten rock. It's unseasonably warm. And for some reason, people have a tendency to think that heaven is up and hell is down. How much more downer can you get? Yeah, that's not the most scientific conclusion one could come to. But I guess it doesn't matter because people bought this hellish hoax, hook, line, and Satan. There are some who believe that the wailing you can hear in this clip actually comes from an old Mario Bava movie called Barren Blood. Barren Blood. Have we seen that? Not sober. <laughs> Kind of, <laughs> sort of, no, I sort of half remember looking at it, but not really paying attention to it. Well, that's fair. Regardless, people honestly thought, oh, shit, that's what hell sounds like. It's not the audience of a Celine Dion in Las Vegas show like we thought. Now, in reality, the Soviets had bored down into the earth more than seven miles. It's called the Kola Super Deep Borehole, which was also my nickname in seminary, so that's kind of an odd no <laughs> coincidence right there. Yeah, well, I mean, these guys, they found some stuff, like weird plankton and a lot of hydrogen, but it's not like they uncovered the writhing spirit of Adolf Hitler or anything awesome like that. Well, that's because it's bullshit. All of it. I mean, they, they drilled, yes, but the rest of it, complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit to the point that it actually got coverage on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, the largest christian television conglomerate in the world and they didn't tell people it was a hoax well why would they telling the people the truth would cut into their profit margin a finnish evangelist sent tbn a story about the hell well with an article that was mistranslated on purpose leading people to believe that the thing was was real now tbn never did their due diligence to show it was a falsehood they just talked about it and then they sort of let it go i guess i wonder how many people still believe this junk at least seven maybe i don't know maybe eight here's one more listen Kind of sounds like the Alice Cooper Rob Zombie show we went to a few years back. It sounds like the studio audience at a Judge Judy taping. Oh, it sounds like a crowd of elders waiting outside a cafeteria that won't open for ten more minutes. <laughs> Where's our early bird special? We got here on time. I want the broiled jugfish and the cream peas. <laughs> 
Look, if hell does sound like this, I don't want to go because I like, you know, more of a rock and roll kind of vibe. But if hell isn't a few miles below the Earth's surface, then H.G. Wells was wrong about that whole journey to the center of the Earth thing. And I don't want to deal with that because that shoots my whole childhood down. Let me just believe that there are a race of subhumans down there with a primordial justice system and blind monsters and hot women in furry bikinis. Well, shit, is that hell? Because that seems really cool, at least, you know, for the weekend. Well, is the devil in the details or is the devil in my pants? Yes. That's what I thought. Shoot first, apologize later. Hey, is it movie time yet? <laughs> well, it is if you want it to be. I will it so. Well, then so mote it be. I need more booze. <laughs> so mote that be too. So much moting. <laughs> Back in a minute, y'all. What are you doing? Aunt P. Well, yeah, but I can hear you. Did you take your mic off? Ah, no, I did not. I, um, uh, this is taking a little longer than expected. Are you going to leave that in the show? I don't know. I mean, maybe. I do have a history of embarrassing myself on this show. Well, yeah, but you could fix it in post. I could. I could fix it in post. But will I? See, that is always the question. Okay, just hurry up, because I have to go. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. Go, baby. See, this is what happens when you don't have access to advertisements for other shows yet. You get to listen to me take a piss. Okay, I am ready to talk about the movie. All right, is it movie time? It's movie time, baby. It's the movie that brought demonic possession to the mainstream. The Exorcist from 1973. Ellen Burstyn, Linda Blair, Max von Sydow, Jason Miller, directed by William Friedkin. Y'all probably know the credits better than we do. This movie is a stone-cold classic. It spawned three or four sequels, depending on your point of view, documentaries, a television show that X really liked, and hundreds of movies that took the same idea and ran it straight into the ground. And thank the gods for that, because otherwise we wouldn't have a show. <laughs> um, we'll be talking about our own copy of the film, which is the director's extended cut. Uh, which also includes the original theatrical version. There was also a cut called The Exorcist, The Version You've Never Seen, which seems to be the standard now, so I figured that is now the version that everyone has seen. We couldn't find the version you don't take home to mother or the version that can save you hundreds of dollars below retail. What are you on about? All the versions of The Exorcist, including some shit I just made up. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you do that. I'd forgotten. All right. You know, there's some fascinating bilocation in this movie because in the first 10 minutes, we switch back and forth between Georgetown, Washington, and Iraq. And it's not like from New York to L.A. or anything like that. It's from Washington State to the fucking Middle East. <laughs> it is. I always get confused. Like, I've seen this movie, what, 50 fucking times at a minimum and I always have to stop and go, okay, where the fuck is Georgetown? Because I think this movie's on the East Coast. I think it's like in Massachusetts or somewhere. See, I get confused about that, too, because doesn't Demi's mother live in New York? Yeah, like in the Bronx? Or, yeah. So how far away is Washington State from New York? I don't know geography for damn it. Uh, it's it's thousands of miles. Like, it's the other side of the fucking country. Okay, well, what the, what, what the, what the fuck happened there? Because... I, I mean, are there subways in other places that I just don't know about? Like, does Washington have a fucking subway that I should know about? Never been. I have no idea. Okay, cool. Maybe somebody can help us out. Hey, explain to us how, how Father Karras fucking teleported <laughs> from Washington State to his mother's apartment in New York. Also, and if that's if it's not the case, tell me, but also tell me how Father Karras, who has taken a vow of poverty, could afford a plane ticket to New York apparently every other fucking day to go visit his mother. 
maybe it's a maybe Georgetown is not in Washington. Maybe it is East Coast. Have you have we actually Googled that shit? No, because Reagan tells her daddy on that dumbass reel to reel recording where she's like, I don't know what to say. I don't know. To, can you hear me? Shut the fuck up. She goes, Well, we're in Washington now, daddy. Okay, Georgetown University is in Washington D.C. And he and okay, okay, fine, that's D.C. But still, Father Karras is wearing Georgetown University sweat gear, running mm -hmm. outfit. So we know that he's in Washington at least, D.C. Yeah, which is not that far from New York. Well, how far how far is Washington D.C. from Washington State? It's they're opposite sides of the country, honey. D.C. is East Coast. Washington State is West Coast. That's the dumbest fucking thing I've heard all goddamn day. <laughs> See, I, no wonder I kept getting confused every time I've seen it. Because I'm like, where the fuck is Georgetown again? And you're like, it's in Washington State. I'm like, fucking what? <laughs> it's not. The university is in D.C., which is only like a couple of hours outside of New York City, if that. So. <laughs> but look, it's not like there's fucking Montana, where Montana is, and then over on on fucking Rhode Island, there's not like Montana, the District of Longmire. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. It that's, doesn't. You're right. That's D fucking stupid. DC is yeah. DC is an anomaly. It's you know. <laughs> Well, fuck, I gotta rewrite the whole goddamn show now. Mm. No, I don't, I'm kidding, but fuck, okay. I mean, thank you for actually looking that up and doing, you know, your due diligence. Uh, right. Which like, I, I apparently have neglected to do before this fucking show. I was um, around with a little fucking computer in my hand all day long, and I, it never occurred to me to, like, Google, where is Georgetown? Universe? Yeah, we all do. We all have these little tiny computers in our pockets, and you know what I do? I look at cats and pussy. That is what I do. <laughs> All fucking day, and occasionally I play a match three game. <laughs> Fuck the entire goddamn Alexandrian library that's out there online. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. anyway, now that we've solved that regional confusion, Jesus. and now we understand it is actually on the East Coast, hey, we're dealing with the D.C. area. <laughs> My friends in D.C. are just like, you stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> okay, here's my first question. I mean, I mean, we've all seen The Exorcist nine billion times, so it's just like, I just want to hit on certain specific areas of it. My yeah. first my first question is, why does Pazuzu have a snake dick? A snake dick, he does. It's so fucking weird. That's, I mean, I, I think that just ties into the whole... Um, classic archetypal symbology for Satan, um, the whole you know snake in the Garden of Eden shit. But the, uh, why the dick? Isn't that weird? Yeah, because I was like, he's got a snake dick, but then the person that played Pazuzu in the movie was a was a was a woman. Which you know, I'm not trying to assume genders or anything like that, but I was just like, God damn, that's um. Well, that's sex is evil, don't you know? Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting. Mm -hmm. I keep forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I wanted to bring up real quick, which I've never heard anyone talk about as far as this movie goes, when uh, Father Karras is in the subway station right before he meets the homeless guy, he's like, you know, I'm a cat like. Can you help me, yeah. Father? I'm a cat like, which I've had fucking nightmares about, but okay. Um, in the background, while he's walking towards the train, you can see a vending machine, all right? And the yeah. vending machine actually says... Buy gum. <laughs> Somebody got fucking paid for that campaign. <laughs> Buy gu got apples? <laughs> yeah, hungry for apples? It's right up there with that. <laughs> ridiculous. All right, here's my next question, and we can discuss this. Reagan, while they're in their rented house in Georgetown, which is apparently in motherfucking D.C., she finds a Ouija board in the basement and starts dicking around with it, okay? And she makes contact with a spirit that calls itself Captain Howdy. Captain so, Howdy. Which is, even for the devil, that's fucking dumb. Um, <laughs> did her experience with the Ouija board cause her to be possessed? 
You know, I've th- I've pondered that myself, um, and I think that a lot of people would say yes because the spirit board is seen as like this evil thing that opens portals or what the fuck ever. And maybe it does. I mean, you know, there's some protocol there and you, you've got to know what you're doing, I guess, and mm-hmm. be able to, to deal with the spirits that could come through. But I don't, I don't think that it necessarily did personally. That's never been my like, Oh, she touched the Ouija board. She's fucked now. She's going to get possessed. Um, That's an incredibly conservative Christian ideal for a movie that is intensely Catholic. Yeah, it really is, but I don't know. See, I never thought so either. I always thought that it was Pazuzu. Yeah, the, the demon thing's already there. And yeah. it's, it's just using that to fuck with her. Well, it's not even using that to fuck with her. It's using that to fuck with Marin. I mean, if you go through the entire fucking chronology, Marin exercised a demon somewhere in Africa, and it took what was it, like 12 years? I don't remember how long it fucking took. I don't remember. So I'm pretty sure Marin has, has met Pazuzu and beaten its ass before, and now Pazuzu's just like, oh, well, here's like the dumbest 12-year-old girl I can find. Let's go ahead and just weasel on in and see what we can do. So I think it's just a setup for, for Pazuzu to get back at Marin. That's, that's, that's my thought. I don't think it's the Ouija board at all. Yeah, I agree with that. I was trying to Google and see how long his first exorcism took, because now I have to know. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, my God. All right, you look that up, and I'll bring up my next point. Okay. I want to talk about Burke Dennings. Burke Dennings is the drunk British director of the movie that the main character, Chris McNeil, is is in. And he's a scrawny little British dude who is drunk all the time. He calls Chris McNeil's domestic help Nazis. He's just, he's a piece of works, what he is. So, he's a fucking asshole. He is, he is just this mincing little British man <laughs> who thinks it's okay to get drunk at a friend's party and make racial slurs and instigate to fucking help to want to fight him. And Reagan, she's all like talking to her mother going, you like him, don't you? You're going to marry him, aren't you? And I'm like, fuck, I fucking hope not. Seriously, right? Right. So anyway, Burke ends up at the bottom of the fucking steps uh, with his head twisted all the way around. (laughs) And the reason is because he was watching Reagan and while she was quote unquote sick. Now, here's my question. Who the fuck leaves a drunk racist in charge of a sick 12-year-old girl? Oh, oh, wait. That's Chris McNeil's assistant, Sharon, the one who's never not wearing a goddamn shawl. That's who does it. And a cardigan. Yeah, a shawl and a cardigan, and she's probably wearing thermals. You know, she got, like, fleece maxi pads. That girl is cold all the fucking time. And... Just the fact that she was like, oh, hey, I've got to go to the drugstore. Do you mind watching, you know, do you mind watching the girl that we've got fucking tied to a bed with the goddamn bedposts covered in pillows or what the fuck ever? Is that cool? Just I'll be gone for half an hour, maybe. Now, goddamn it, I used to work in the news industry, okay? I've heard of people leaving their kids in the fucking car while they go to the strip bar and get drunk, and it'd be 100 fucking degrees outside. This is right up there with that, as far as I'm concerned. Let's do the most irresponsible thing possible with a person who's completely helpless. Oh, but then it's okay, apparently, because Pazuzu fucking threw Burke out the window after breaking his neck. (laughs) I think Pazuzu did Reagan a favor. I think so, too. (laughs) She's fucking passed out, and there's this... (laughs) There's this creepy guy. Yeah, this creepy guy. Like, what the fuck? I mean, you really, this, this is a guy, I mean, you do not want his kind of long, skeletal fingers skittering up your mm-hmm. inner thigh. Yeah. Hey, you! What? <laughs> don't tell me you weren't thinking it. You. I don't want to think that. Okay. I was thinking it. So I have a question. What was, for you... Does this movie scare you on any level, or has it ever? Like, the first time you saw it, was there, like, this thing that was, like, really shocking, or was there anything that was actually scary to you about this movie? No. No? No. 
I think this movie's got a lot of layers to it. It's got a lot of nuances, but it never really scared me. It um, made me uncomfortable a few times. Yeah. But I was never like, oh no, the poor innocent twelve-year-old girl is being possessed by a, the devil. That never crossed my mind. I was just like, wow, that that kind of sucks. This is like the worst fucking ABC after-school special I've ever seen. <laughs> because think about it, Reagan's got Reagan's got daddy issues. Father Karras has mommy issues. Yeah. Uh, Chris O'Neill's got husband issues. Father Marin has got uh, physical issues. He's got heart problems, apparently. Yeah, Marin's a fucking wreck. Dude. He's he's just a he's just a scarecrow on his last fucking legs. Mm-hmm. So everybody has all these other issues that play into the story at large. Not to mention that Reagan is just so sweet and innocent, it just makes her obnoxious. It's it really like, does, yeah. It's like as soon as she pops up and starts talking about how she wants a horse. <laughs> Of course, Reagan wants a fucking horse. I've seen Equus. Um, but doesn't everybody in this movie just fucking need to get laid? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that would have solved everything, but I think it would have taken their other issues down a couple notches. Yeah. Father Karras was like, I think I've lost my faith. I need to get really, really drunk. Oh, my mother's dead. Oh, I've suddenly found myself in a state that's not a state. It's a district. I don't know what the hell's going on or where I am temporarily. You know, all this other shit. And then, I don't know. But no, it it never scared me because I was, I was always too caught up in the psychological issues that the other characters had. That's a good spinoff. Father Karras and Reagan's mom hook up. He, like, fucks her on the washing machine in the basement while she's ironing his sweater. <sighs> she gets stuck in the washer. <laughs> and, he slowly, and he slowly undoes his cassock. <laughs> <sighs> no, I, I think... Um, this movie scared me initially, but which I've talked about this, I think, on the show before, and how just the concept of possession has always been, like, something that's really scary for me. So, um, the spider walk scene scared the shit out of me the first time I saw it, because the, the first time that I saw this movie, it didn't include that clip, right. so I didn't see that bit until, you know, I had already seen the, the rest of the film a couple of times. So. Yeah, that was, that was like a showstopper scene. They cut that, because that's all people talked about for the rest of the movie. It was just like, yeah, everything else was kind of scary, but by God, did you see her walk backwards down those fucking stairs? <laughs> Puke blood it running around. I don't know how she didn't get that completely up her nostrils. Oh, and... man, can you imagine getting that up your nose like it's a like it's a Coke? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> a little more gummy than a Coke, I would think. <laughs> we, had, we had to put peanuts in her fake blood so it wouldn't fizz out. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I found this movie to be intensely scary, and I still do. It still makes me kind of curl up and cringe in several several places as many times as I've seen it. So, and that's really cool for you know somebody like me that's seen a fucking blue million different horror movies across all kinds of subgenres. So this is this is in in my top five probably as far as like favorite horror movies of all time. So there's this one scene where Karis throws holy water on Reagan while he's recording her with his reel-to-reel tape. Mm -hmm. And she starts babbling and saying all kinds of weird shit nobody can understand. But it turns out, after he takes it uh, to, takes a recording to an audiologist's lab, that she's actually speaking English backwards. Yeah. Okay. Did this scene create 1980s heavy metal? (laughs) That's a legit question, man. Because suddenly you've got all these people who are like, oh, if you play that backwards, it's telling you to worship Satan. I think that there are a lot of things. <laughs> I say a lot of things. I can think of one. I'm sure there are more. But I can think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that there are things from this movie that led to the 80s satanic panic that people just kind of absorbed 
and started to believe were true. You know, yeah. like the like the Satan Satan talks backwards. Well, I mean, think about it. This movie came out in seventy one, right? Seventy three. So, seventy three. Okay, I was close to it. So you've got people who are teenagers that went and saw this movie. Maybe they weren't supposed to, but they went and saw it. I don't know what the fucking age limit was at that point in time. But and then now they're adults and they're having their own kids and they're you know their kids are wanting to listen to this shit and it's like, oh my god, <laughs> it's the fucking exorcist all over again. My kid's gonna get possessed by Captain Howdy. And the people who are making the recordings may have been thinking the same thing, but I mean I can only think of a couple of of, of backward backmasking examples that happened before the exorcist came out mm -hmm. one of them i'm not even sure of get your get your google machine up that really famous backmasking clip um by led zeppelin where it was like i think it's from, is it from stairway to heaven it might be i can't remember but like you could allegedly hear robert plant saying my sweet satan satan sets me on the i don't know the the road to katmandu or some bullshit um Hang on. Yep. It was Stairway. Okay. What? Here in, my, here in my sad little shed with Satan and Punky Brewster. I don't know. Uh, but it, this is funny, though. The top <laughs> Google search. People also ask, what songs have hidden messages when played backwards? Oh, shit. Really? The second one is, what song played backwards sounds like devil? <laughs> And then the third one is the what? The elevator movie? I don't know. The third one is what is Stairway to Heaven backwards? Let's see. The alleged message which occurs during the middle section of the song, if there's a bustle in your hedgerow, don't be alarmed now, when played backward, was purported to contain the satanic references. Here's to my sweet Satan. The one whose little path would make me sad, whose power is Satan. The one whose little path would make me sad. <laughs> that sounds like my dating profile. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, you go okay. looking oh. for something, you're going to find it. That's all I have to say about that. What year did that come out? That was on Zeppelin Four. Was that 72? Um, hang on, let me look. Um, the Trinity Broadcasting Network claimed that hidden messages were contained in the song in 1982. Um, okay, but when when did that when did Let's Up and Four come out? What was the release date for that? Um, hang on. Because Trinity Trinity Broadcasting Network thought the well to hell was real. Led Zeppelin Four. That came out, it was released 8th of November, 1971. Okay, so that predates The Exorcist by two years. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. maybe there's precedence for this, because I know a lot of bands listened to Led Zeppelin and thought, we should really start a band. We should totally start stealing blues songs by old black musicians and making them our own and not giving them any money for it. That's how Led Zeppelin started, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So maybe it didn't create 80s heavy metal, but I think it definitely had an influence on 80s heavy metal. How about that? Maybe. I think more to the point is that it influenced um, the public's thinking and fear of 80s metal, at least the conservative side of the public. Which is really funny now, especially yeah. if you look at a band like Motley Crue. Yeah. Because, because back in the day, Motley Crue was just the fucking devil personified. <laughs> Shout at the devil, and they ran around with fucking no shirts on and face paint and having pentagrams on their bass drum heads. And Let's now, get. and now Vince Neil is just this fucking, just this fucking old dude wearing a Shawn Michaels hat running around. You know, he's like, I used to bang strippers <laughs> in Vegas, bird to bird. <laughs> You're yeah. not you're not the devil at all. You're like you're my you're like my oh you're like my drunk uncle. Drunk, well, uncle, drunk <laughs> uncle Vince. Drunk Uncle Vince wants to talk about the showgirls. Okay, let him go. Thanksgiving's <laughs> almost over. He can sleep on the couch. 
And you've also got Alice Cooper, who was just like one of those figures I remember as a kid that was like the, oh, no, the Alice Cooper is the devil. And uh, yeah, Alice Cooper's a Christian. He's a Christian who plays golf. <laughs> it's so funny. It's the, it's, it's showbiz, man. It's showbiz. Yeah, it is. Speaking of showbiz, I want to throw this out here real quick. I call this the, the Pazuzu parallel. <laughs> There's this one shot during the exorcism at the end of the film where you can see the statue of Pazuzu in Reagan's room and Reagan on the bed kind of posing in a Pazuzu-esque uh, stance. Yeah. Does she not look really weirdly like the ultimate warrior getting ready to wrestle Hulk Hogan back in the 80s? It's the fringe, dude. Is it the fringe? It is. It's the fucking <laughs> fringe. It's the straps hanging off of her arms. You're thinking, oh my god. Because I just want her to like stop and just go, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and she totally could. She had that whole deep, growly, gravelly voice. She going. could have said it backwards, and people would have thought she was summoning the devil. Nope. <laughs> Just, just, just trying to call forth the real American Hulk Hogan. <laughs> oh, boy. But all in all, how do you feel about the end of this movie? Because it has a very Disney ending, right? Like the the bad guy's dead, and Reagan is restored to normal, and they get to go off and do their tour of Europe that they, you know, she was planning before all of the shit started. You know, that's a good question. Yeah, she doesn't remember anything, but she mm -hmm. suddenly has this really kind of weird thing for priests, which... Uh, <laughs> that'll come up later. Yeah, no shit. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be an issue. Um, I don't hate the ending. I think you're right. It is very, very Disney-esque. I mean... I kind of, personally, I kind of think it needed it. Because that little girl went through so much. I think and, the audience needed it. Yeah, it was it was kind of like this. <gasps> okay, all that scary shit is done, and the little girl is going to be okay. And the mother, who actually I really kind of hate her mom. Oh, but, lot. I hate that bitch. Jesus. Yeah, I mean she's I I do not think she's a good human being. But she had her kid, so you know you're kind of you can kind of empathize a little bit, even if you don't really like her as a person. Well, doesn't loving your kid make you at least partially a good human being? How, how do you think she's a bad human being? I don't. It, it's the way she interacts with everybody else and how easily she fucking freaks out. Like I have been in some really stressful situations with my kid, and you've seen me. When I get in fucking freak out mode and things are really scary and real, I am calm and cool as a fucking cucumber until I know everything's okay. And that's when I have my breakdown. That's but this true. woman's, she's popping off like every five minutes in this movie. She is, she's just like right under the surface. And I don't like, to, I don't like the way she's like coddling for Burke. I mean, I guess he's her boss technically, but. He is deplorable, and she, she's fucking friendly with him, and apparently is okay with him watching her kids. So you know, she and, wasn't there. It was Sharon, the freezing cold assistant, who who let Burke up there. Oh yeah, that's fair. Still, I I just don't like her. Well, I don't like Sharon. <laughs> fucking bitch. Seriously, that's that's like a well. This will be fine. I guess I'll just, you know, ask for forgiveness later. And then shit just gets way out of control, and Burke ends up at the bottom of the fucking steps with his neck twisted. That's horrifying. That's like, well, I was watching your kids, but then I went out to the garage to get my damn <laughs> spilled popcorn butter on my pants, and then I got, <laughs> I got tried to crawl out a window and I had to call for Lindsay to come and help me and <laughs> wait you're mixing mythos again I am damn it I'm so sorry <laughs> it's the fucking mojitos they do this to me 
but anyway, yeah, I agree with you. I think the audience probably needed that kind of that just the breathing space because the movie really is intense from Jump Street. Like <laughs> it starts getting heavy pretty much immediately. <clears throat> You're right. You got anything else to say about this thing? Um, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Um, and you know, but even with all that, it's hard to find. There's really nothing new or controversial that we can say about the exorcist that hasn't, that, that already hasn't been said before by fans, by scholars, by members of the film crew. Like, and I've said this before. I don't, I don't think it's a scary movie. It never frightened me, but i tell you what, man, the, the few times when there were medical procedures being done, oh. those freaked me the fuck out. So not the actual possession scenes, but just, you know, I can handle a demon inside of a young teenage girl, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably been me at some point in my life. But fuck that throat thing with the stopper oh. and the blood shooting out under the puppy Man. pee pad that they put over her non-existent tits. Fuck that. The arteriosclerosis thing? No. And that hospital seems so fucking dirty. <laughs> It just seems like an unsanitary place. You got the doctors outside in the hallway smoking cigarettes and throwing them on the damn floor. I do not want that. Is that what is that what hospitals were like in the goddamn District of Columbia in 1973? Because fuck no. Maybe, man. Everybody used to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> I mean, that's weird to believe Hollywood. Fucking everybody used to smoke cigarettes. Everywhere. <laughs> And, you know, I can't imagine anybody in this audience hasn't seen The Exorcist more than five times, honestly. But just in case you guys haven't hit play on this movie for some reason or another, we are about to boil it all down for you. I'm going to give you six reasons why you should or should not watch The Exorcist. X is going to give you his six reasons. And then our friends, Ray and Persephone, will give you their six reasons. That is six, six, and six. It's the number of the geeks. Fuck it. I'm ready whenever you guys are. Okay. Who goes first? Oh, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Ray goes first. They were like begging to go first. Oh, where are they now? Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> I, not, I think, uh, I do I not think, think we they know believe which you. one of us is the kid in class who's prepared and which one of us is the one that's stalling. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'll go first. I'll make the first point. Are you going to make the yeah. first point? I okay. will. I'll make their first point. I've got some that are like pretty good points and some that are just kind of lame because I was struggling to come up with six fucking points. Even <laughs> this is a great movie and I really love it. Um, but for me, and you guys might completely disagree with this, but I think for a movie that came out almost 50 years ago, it doesn't feel dated. Like aside from the obvious, mm -hmm. like the fashion and the lack of cell phones, I just don't feel like they pull you out of the story the way that some older movies do. And I just don't feel like it impacts it. So when I'm watching this film, it's like I have to stop and think, oh, yeah, this movie was made fucking almost 50 years ago. Yeah, I agree with that. It was kind of one of my points is kind of along the same lines as that. So I'll wait. OK, well, then I'll go ahead with my point that is along the same line with with that, because um, I think one of the things that's really disarming about The Exorcist is the style in which it's filmed. Friedkin kind of has almost a documentary sort of style with this, and it's not flashy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not trying to be edgy or dark, even though it's about, you know, a 12-year-old girl that's possessed by a demon. Um, but, yeah. there's, but there's a really weird standoffishness about The Exorcist, you know? I mean, it's like, here's what's happening. Look at it. It doesn't repeatedly zoom in on Reagan, you know, vomiting green paste onto the exorcist. It just happens. That yeah. style almost works better than the current state of horror movies where it's all jump scares and everything's filmed through some mm -hmm. shitty blue filter. I absolutely agree. I do love the no jump scares. Jump scares are a big sound. <laughs> 
seemed to definitely stay focused on what it was trying to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, along that line, I'll give my first reason. Um, the special effects. Like, I know that sounds weird because compared to today's special effects, like, you know, it seems silly now, but like when you take it in context of the time, right, and what they did and how elaborate their seat, you know, their their settings and, you know, like each scene where Reagan is acting out, I guess, <laughs> looking at the behind the scenes, you know, setup of how they were doing certain things and just for for how big it was and how much they did to put into the special effects. And like, you know, it's one of those films where even though it, it, you can kind of look at some of the special effects and go, that's silly. Right. But it's still kind of, it's jarring at the Mm -hmm. same time. Like, and so it, it wasn't so much about how realistic it looks as the concept as a whole, I think. And so I really appreciate the way that they utilize that, but in a structural way of like actually just looking at the technology that they did at the time, I'm just really impressed by that. And I think that it does show um, because, you know, you can cut corners and get the, the point across, but I think that the, the more you put into, the more effort you put into that sort of thing, where typically people may not think it matters. Like those little things can change your perception of the movie. Completely. Oh yeah, totally. We're huge fans so, of practical effects. Like you, yeah. you know, I, they, they do some amazing things with CGI these days, but I really miss just the sheer art that is mm-hmm. practical effects. Just slap four or five condoms on a guy's face and blow them up with an air tube. You're good to go. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Paint it. <laughs> right. Paint yeah. it. Fill them with blood. <laughs> Just <laughs> let it rip. But, you know, like the, the scenes where Reagan, you know, you could see the air was so cold. Mm-hmm. That was a refrigerated room. They could have just, like, figured out a way to make it look like, you know, someone was breathing and you could, it was cold. But, like, just the, that's a huge deal, right? That they kept a whole room refrigerated to the point where like you could really see some of those things and that it not only did that, it pushed the actors into yeah. that environment. So it, they're able to kind of deep dive more into who these characters are and connect with them, you know? And so I think that that is those sorts of things that they did um, really I think made it a much better film. As oh a yeah. It lends authenticity. Mm-hmm. Persephone, would you like to weigh in with anything? <laughs> oh, is it my go? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, then here I go. I, I uh, can definitely appreciate that. Uh, this movie is definitely a, a cultural touchstone uh, of its time period for the subject matter that it was, uh, displaying throughout the film with all of the religion and how they discussed religion and all of that, how the movie started up in the beginning. I'm a chronic overanalyzer, and I'll probably (laughs) touch on some of those points later in this discussion, but I, I was definitely paying attention to every single thing from the opening scenes at the archaeological sites all the way to the end and trying to make some connections along the way and seeing if the other characters actually talked about any of the things that I was noticing. So, but I could definitely see shock value for folks of the time period for witnessing a, a movie presented in this way, especially with uh, how religious a lot of folks were at that time period. And still, even today, it's still can be quite shocking to a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that bleeds into one of my points it's is very- that, No jump scares. It really stayed focused on uh, really what it was trying to accomplish, like I said earlier. It can definitely be applauded for that in in its simplicity and uh, plot and presentation, but also it has many layers of depth to it. It's it's a classic story and that it's, you know, it's good versus evil, um, you know, this threat to destroy innocence and the struggle for salvation and faith. Because you've got, you know, Father Karras, who is struggling with whether or not he even still fucking believes in God. Um, And it's compelling. 
I think yeah. the way that they lay that out and how they layer it. <laughs> that was one of my points was just how human each of the characters were, that it was about good versus evil and, you know, how they had the, the dogs and one was, you know, it had the dark fur versus the white dog. And like, you know, you saw these symbols of kind of what the, the struggle was, but in that they were showing like these people who have real life struggles and not necessarily because there's something evil <laughs> making it happen, but that yeah. it's just a part of life and that they're a part of, you know, and I appreciated especially how they were just really well-rounded and it felt um, like the actors really ha were connected with their characters because it was just like every, even the smaller parts were just so good. And, um, you know, I appreciated how they show priests or they showed priests who were like attending a party, <laughs> you know, and and then it's not just like they're they're sitting reading the Bible and and praying every second of every day, you know, that they still have families. They still have, you know, these other things that they're a part of and that they enjoy doing. And so I just really appreciated that it was different than those classic like here's this holy representation and let's make put them higher than everybody else. I just thought it was really interesting that it was about being good in the sense of concern for this little girl and trying to get her well, no matter what that meant. There was just so much depth to that theme throughout the movie. And it was just, I feel like that's, that was a very beautiful thing to see, you know, that they, they didn't just go with the stereotypical good versus evil story. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. I find it really fascinating that they used actual Jesuit priests that played roles in The Exorcist. Because it kind of gives the movie almost a subliminal uh, authenticity. Like the guy that played Father Dyer, the one who gives Karis his last rites after he goes, mm -hmm. you know, rolling, rolling on the river. Um, that was the Reverend William O'Malley S.J. Uh, <laughs> SJ stands for Society of Jesus, which I guess you have to join in order to become a Jesuit. I don't know. Sounds like you should get a fucking decoder ring. But I think the inclusion of real priests in this movie is it's unobtrusive, but it, it kind of helps to ground the movie in a way mm -hmm. so that it's still believable. You know, it, it builds yep. out that universe really, really well. And speaking of that, can we just talk about this cast for just a minute? Because this was one of my points, too. Fucking amazing cast. Yes. I didn't realize that they had actual uh, Jesuit priests in the movie. That's that's cool. Yeah. But, like, you've got Linda Blair, okay, playing Reagan. She was, mm -hmm. like, around 13, 14 years old. Well, she mm -hmm. was 14 when the movie was released. I mean, fuck. For a child actor, all the shit that they mm -hmm. put that girl through, she did amazing. Yeah. And then she did fuck all that I remember after that, other than some cameos and some shit that mm -hmm. I've never seen. Um, well, wasn't she in, was it the second Exorcist movie or something? Yeah. 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 She did the second one. You don't remember Savage Streets? No, I don't remember that. Oh. Wait, there's a second Exorcist movie? <laughs> Dude, yeah, there's like five. Right? Oh, well, oh okay. wow! I know of at least three, but the third one is the fucking best one. Really? What? I love the third one. It's okay. terrifying. That's that's debatable, but I also okay. really really love Exorcist three. Okay, so but then we also have um, Ellen Bursting who played Chris oh. McNeil. Yeah, um, love her. Horrible character though. Like that woman was just on the verge of exploding at all times. Yeah. I, I, for me, the only redeeming factor for that character was how much she loved her daughter and yeah. how much she sacrificed to take care of and make sure her daughter was okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, astronomical performance by her. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Max von Sydow. Okay, he played Father Marin. Yep. And X, I might need you to fact check this. I pulled this off of IMDb, but they said he was born in 1929, okay? Okay. So that that would have made him 44 years old when he yeah. played Father Marion. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. They, that was a special effects thing. They made him look a lot older than what he actually was. That's crazy. He looks like yeah. he's fucking 80 years old in that movie. Yep. 
I was know. so great. And you have to give him credit for his physical acting too, because yes. it's one thing to just play. He could have played that where his hands were steady and we wouldn't have really thought about it. But the fact that just whenever he was trying to hold something and his hands were shaking so badly and, and you know, you believed that he was frail and that he was, you know, kind of withering away. And I just, when I found out how young he was, I was like, wow, like props to the special effects team and props to, uh, or I guess makeup, whatever. And yeah. props to the actor who who was able to take what they did and make it real. Make it I, I just Yeah, I think it's awesome. Yeah, in fact, this last time we watched this, the the opening sequences where he's walking across that big archaeological dig yep. Yep. and I just I turned to X and I said that is a man who it, every step he takes is agony because he looks yep. like he is in pain he is just shuffling he's walking so slowly and deliberately yep astounding one more thing yep. about von Sydow and that according to an interview I read with director William Friedkin for like 2014 Von Sydow was an atheist, and he had really? a very difficult time getting through some of those scenes because he just didn't believe in God. Yeah. Wow. See? Fucking Max Von Sydow. Awesome. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got Jason Miller, who played Father Karras, and yeah. I I know he's been in a fuck ton of stuff, too, but I don't know anything else other than he was just phenomenal in this film. I loved his character. Yeah. He every time I watch it, you know, I I think he was the character that I appreciate the most. Yeah. Because there's so much that he did with just the way he looked. Similar to Karis, right? Like they just did they it was like they were immersed in these characters. Mm -hmm. They became these characters. But they didn't you know, you see a lot of actors stepping up to uh play parts of really well known people you know, and do really great with, um, I guess, kind of their impression of, of that character. And that's amazing. A lot of people can't do that. But to be able to take a character and do that with something that no one knows yeah. outside of that is, I think, because you have to imagine that before you can actually make it come alive. And so I, and the director has part of it too, right? And, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's great. It is great. And I want to make one more point about one more cast member, and then somebody else can weigh in on some others if they want to. But the woman that played Karis's mother, that little mm -hmm. old lady, mm -hmm. she was born in Athens, Greece. Her name was, if I can pronounce it right, I'm probably going to butcher it, but um, Vasiliki Malarios. Okay. She was like 90 fucking years old. Wow. And she died. February, 10 months before this movie was released, she passed away. Wow. That's <laughs> I killed the room. <laughs> well, no, no. I was just sitting here thinking about it, you know, like, just how, I mean, she died in the movie, too, right? She she was dead in the movie, right? I'm yes, she did. she did. She died. Yeah. Yes, she died. So it's just a little heavy, you know? It was almost <laughs> like she literally, in her last role, she dies. And then she actually died. I'm like, whoa. Like my third reason would be, and it's not surprising coming from me, but the cinematography, how they they shot the movie. I think one of my favorite things they did was they made you feel claustrophobic when you were in the room with Reagan and she was acting out. So it was like that scene where, you know, the furniture moves and the mom gets thrown to or smack to the ground that feels so claustrophobic to me and you could feel the mother just being terrified and you could almost connect more with that kind of feeling even though there's no way you can imagine that actually happening I just think it was really brilliant a lot of the shots that they did and but coming from a photographer that's not very surprising <laughs> Yeah, well, and actually that was one of my points, too. I mean, aside from that, you know, iconic shot of Father Marin arriving at the yep. McNeil house, you know, because that's been used and abused 
for <laughs> the, mm-hmm. almost five decades since the movie came out. The fog yeah, machine you, shot, like there was a yeah, terrible dry yeah. ice storm that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, like you said, you've got that shot of Chris McNeil cowering in the corner of Reagan's bedroom when she's trying to dodge the flying furniture. Um, you know, you've got when Chris and Father Karras first meet and they're walking across that little footbridge, you know, and yeah. the, the camera kind of pans out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've got where Father Marin and Father Karras walk into Reagan's bedroom for the very first time. Just how mm-hmm. that's like a chilling scene, yeah. just the way they shot that. Yeah. And then, you know, that final scene where the McNeil car is driving away from Father Dyer and Reagan's yeah. thing from the rearview window. It's just like, yep. God. It's just yep. fucking beautiful all the way around. Uh, uh, one of the my favorite shots, too, was where Chris is walking home. You mm-hmm. know, she says, I'm going to walk home today. And it follows her. And I know it's I mean, it's such a simple thing. But with pairing it with the music and things like I just and her passing by people, for some reason, it just like gave another little bit of context to like taking a normal world right? Nothing yeah. like not every scene has to be this elaborate, uh, you know, dramatic thing. Uh, it felt very much like you were looking at normal people or as normal as an actress mom can be, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I really, I really appreciated that. Oh, and then the scene where they're sitting in the, kind of like the hallway or whatever near Reagan's room, the two priests, mm-hmm. and they're facing opposite directions and it's lit with these shadows, you know, and that whole scene feels heavy. Yeah. And it's there's barely strong. any dialogue. So many little things like that that's put, like, it's spaced out really nicely. And, you know, there there's a good mix, too, of how fast-paced everything is. I This is such a great movie for so <laughs> many reasons. <laughs> we have dominated the conversation, I think, you and I, Ray. Yeah. Yep. Persephone, do you want to weigh in with anything again? Well, that that's a perfect segue to my next point, the set design for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, really filming a lot of the scenes in a, a, a residential home. Uh, one of the things that can quickly and immediately date a movie is like, especially when you're filming like a, a teenager's room, is they'll cram it full of like pop culture and things like that. And it's just not very realistic. You know, they, it seemed like a, a, all this, the places, like even like Father Karras' when he was like visiting his mother and you see all the little details in the background on the shelves of like mm-hmm. family photos or pictures of himself, like being a boxer when he was younger. Those little things add so much humanity to the characters and gives you a little glimpse into their past. And I, I really appreciated how simple and, and modestly, they showed, like, the family living in their home. Uh, a lot of movies just don't do that. And I, I, I can definitely appreciate such simplicity, especially in a movie like this. Yeah. I mean, doesn't Reagan have, like, pictures of, like, clowns and horses and shit? Yeah. And not, like, the, little... and not like the fucking Partridge family or anything <laughs> that would have been well, popular at that point in time? Yeah. I know that in the basement, she has like a little art section. And I think that that's where the majority of that is. I know her little figurines are around the house, but in her actual room, I don't remember anything really being on the walls, which I think was. That's because it all fell I mean, off when even, the fucking demon the took stuff, over. Yeah. Stuff, <laughs> even the stuff that was on the walls, you know, it, it just didn't date the movie. Yeah. And, and I think. Watching the. the yeah. And, and it feels. It's timeless, right, in the sense of there's not this stuff that's blatantly, you know, from that time. And they didn't try so hard to try and make it feel a certain way or during a certain time, which is why I think a lot of people can connect with it in the same way as whenever it came out. Right. Yeah. Which I know when it came out, people were like, uh, oh, oh, hell no. <laughs> but, but like over time, you know, and sometimes I like movies just for the questions that they raise. OK, mm-hmm. now here's a movie that's called The Exorcist, but there are two exorcists. So is this movie about Father Marin or Father Karras? Suck on that for a little minute <laughs> while you're watching. <laughs> They could have called it the exorcists. 
They didn't. It was just yeah, the but line. that's hard to say. Well, <laughs> okay, yeah, it is hard to say. <laughs> but, but I don't know. I mean, it's it's. I I don't know who the title is referring to. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Hmm. Well, good that it's somebody else's fucking turn. <laughs> Well, I want to bring up a point real quick because, Persephone, you've mentioned a couple of times about jump scares and how you don't like jump scares and how this is kind of a slow boil and it's, you know, it's got the relatable characters and it really kind of gets you wrapped into the story. But I just want to bring up that the almost comedic and jarring appearance of Pazuzu's face randomly through the world. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, is that supposed to be a jump scare? Was that what that was inserted for? I don't think it was necessary, honestly. No. It's one of those things that just makes like every time it yeah. happens. Yeah. yeah. Of all the things I expected Pazuzu to look like, it was not an angry mime. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> So for me, that's the only thing, really, that kind of pulls yeah. me out of the story momentarily is just like, all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking like floating midair. <laughs> Why? Oh, no, the demon's on the stove hood. Well, I've given all my reasons. Okay. I mean, I could probably come up with more. <laughs> I have one more. Persephone, do you have any more? I, I could say words. I don't know if they're reasons. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> How did I end up with like having three left? We've got to work on this. It's okay. This will get better. Uh, well, sure. well, you go ahead, baby. Uh, Jesus, what if I accidentally wrote seven reasons? That would fuck everything up, wouldn't it? <laughs> nope, it's just six. Okay. Um, we were talking about Pazuzu's face just kind of floating there in, in midair, you know. Another reason you should watch this movie, the opposite of the new Pazuzu review the spider walk. Dude. Oh, yeah. Because Oliver. because fuck to. that. Completely fucking creepy. Not scary, but completely fucking creepy. What was that Persephone you were trying to make a comment I couldn't hear you? Oh, the the version Ray and watched uh, last week. It didn't have that scene in there. Oh, yeah. It was added later. They took that scene out. I don't know how familiar yeah. you are with the history of the original King Kong. With the original King Kong had a scene where the explorers were trying to get across this gorge on a tree that had fallen. Okay? They would fall off of the tree into the gorge of eternal peril, but there were giant <laughs> fucking spiders down there that ate them. And they cut that scene out of the movie. The movie was over. It was all this stuff with a gigantic ape. And people just kept talking about the spiders. So they were like, mm, no, this has to go. And it's lost. Nobody nobody can find that footage. Good. I don't want to see any giant spiders. <laughs> <laughs> so they did kind of the same thing with this, sex is what you're saying. For the theatrical release, they cut out the spider walk. Yes. And then they, they put it back in later for one of the other 900 versions of The Exorcist that came out from Warner Brothers. Nice. Yeah. I love that scene. It's... <laughs> It's fucked up. <laughs> I can't remember. Where in the movie is that scene? Is that right before she, like, comes down during the end of the party? No, I think that's right that's after... Enough. It's right after Lieutenant Kinderman leaves, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Right after he leaves, she comes scuttling backwards down the damn stairs, sh- shooting blood out of her mouth, and generally being, you know, socially unacceptable. <laughs> Well, and that brings me to my final point, and I, I think I might have mentioned this just in the general conversation that you and I had about the movie X on the, the main beef of the show, but right I know this is arguable, especially with you, because it's, it's not the same experience for you, but for me, this movie gives good scare. You know, we've talked about it, the lack of the jump scares and how we get kind of enveloped in the story a couple of times over, but you can't help but be afraid for Reagan's safety for one, you know, and for Chris McNeil's sanity for yeah. another. And, yep. you know, for Father Karras's faith, like you, you really feel for that guy and you're like, you know, kind of rooting for him to kind of find that because he's wrapped so much of his life up into it. And then, you know, for Father Maris's life, which, you know, 
or Father Marin's life. He he kind of lost that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's the, the the whole movie for me from start to finish is just as you see, kind of scary, and I love it for that. You know, as somebody who struggles with mental illness, right? The first time I saw it, it was before I got my diagnoses. But just watching this the other night, I, w- I really thought about it and was thinking about how in a lot of ways, those are symptoms of mental illness. And like, just thinking of how similar it is, even though, you know, they imply that it's, you know, something evil, a demon supernatural thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't help but think about, like, in a real-life situation, there were probably a lot of people who could relate to Reagan having to go through all of these tests and stuff and still not get answers, mm-hmm. you know. And that's one of the fear factors for this movie. Exactly. It's just all of the shit she had to endure. Yep. And all those doctors still couldn't figure out what the fuck was wrong with her. And they just kind of threw yep. up their hands and was like, do you know any priests? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And all I, this lithium didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Guess and we'll I call think, in the clergy. I think it, you know, she had to, what, have spinal taps and like. Yeah, dude. And Angioplasty. Um, you know, she's stuck in all of these machines. And one thing the film didn't touch on, and I think it was because, you know, like they need to add the struggle and like how this was just affecting Reagan as a girl. Right. Mm-hmm. Like when you really stop to think about how in the beginning she knew that there was that conflict, that there was something wrong and she didn't know what it was at that. You know what I mean? And, and so I think, I think it's just interesting. Like that's where my mind goes. Like, I, I wonder how much of it affected her really. And like, yeah, it is interesting. The psychology of that, the psychology of, of quote demon possession yeah, exorcism. Have you ever seen yeah. the exorcism of Emily Rose? Yes. Oh, for fuck's sake. I know. We did a whole episode on that, but um, it, I loved it just for that simple fact is that it it really delved into the psychology of, of the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to be like, oh, mentally ill people look like this. I'm just saying psychosis can look like that. Uh, mm-hmm. some of the Some of the stuff, you know, like... But, like, the majority of people who deal with mental illness aren't violent people. And I think that that's important to say. But I do think that it's interesting that, like, Karis, he knew about psychology. And and yet he was struggling. You could tell, at the very least, he was struggling with depression. Mm -hmm. And how that was affecting him. And even in when he's with his mom, you know, he's there because he cares about her and he wants to take care of her, but you can tell it, it, he, it's that struggle, right? When he's there, he's still sad that he has to leave, Mm -hmm. you know, and he wants to be near his mom. And, and so I just think that, you know, when you look further into the characters, you know, there is that kind of struggle too. And, and, um, I think that it alluded that, uh, you know, at the end where, um, Reagan sees the priest and then she kisses him on the cheek. That to me was always a little bit of a sign of like, I remember more than I want to say, mm-hmm. kind of. And how even if she doesn't remember, how that's a sign of somewhere in her brain having that memory of that trauma. Mm-hmm. And so I, I just thought that that was an interesting little thing too. Okay, X, you got another one? I do. I have two more actually, but um, I want to kind of harken back to what Ray was saying earlier. I think more so than any movie since The Wolfman back in the 30s, the 1930s, The Exorcist really put the art of practical makeup effects in the national spotlight. Now, you were talking about props to the makeup artist. That guy was Dick Smith. And Dick Smith uh, wound up, sort of became a household name, but he wound up winning an honorary Oscar for his contribution. Oh, wow. uh, to the makeup effects field. So That's yeah, cool. very cool guy. So definitely we'll watch the exorcist just for the makeup and that, and, and that careful eye toward detail. I want to bring up the relationship between Lieutenant Kinderman and the priests, first father Karras and then father Dyer. I think that's a fascinating piece of writing for both of those relationships because it reminds me a lot of um, 
Well, me, to be honest, it's all based <laughs> around old movies, and Lieutenant Kinderman just makes shit up about these movies, and both priests are like, oh, I've seen it. You know, and it's fucking funny to me. I just like, oh, those are so dated references. Yeah, well, I get them. So I love that aspect of the script. And it seems like it should slow the movie down because those bits are so talky. I think they add such great depth to it. I love it. And in, in The Exorcist 3, which I know you guys haven't seen, it gets even better because Kinderman and Father Dyer are like best friends in that movie, and they talk. Yes, and George C. Scott plays Kinderman in that movie, and he fucking nails it. Just and it's awesome. beautiful. Yeah. But that's another show. Yep. <laughs> If you are listening to this podcast and you haven't watched The Exorcist, crawl out from under your fucking rock and watch The Exorcist, please. I concur. Yeah, I, I, it took me a really long time to see it, but I, I feel like it's a movie everybody should see. You know, anything can become a game if you work hard enough at it, including watching movies, especially if there's alcohol involved. Oh boy, it's time for the nation's favorite drinking game, Drink It With The Devil, where your love of bad movies meets your disdain for your own liver. Anybody in the McNeil house pulls up their sweater or their shawl up on their shoulders a little bit more because they're cold. <laughs> Drink. Every time that Reagan's mother uses the phrase, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Drink. Every time Father Karras looks more morose than he did in the previous scene. Drink every time that you see Father Marin's hands shake. Jesus. <laughs> Drink every time you see the subliminal image of Pazuzu, like the demonic Tyler Durden. <laughs> demonic Tyler Durden. <laughs> drink every time you see a priest drink. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Because that is a lot of drinking. <laughs> All right, finally, our Grand Master Challenge. Drink every time Fathers Karis and Marin say, the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> Don't they say that like 20 times? In a row! Just, just keep the bottle handy. <laughs> now is usually the time when we answer questions from our listeners. Yeah, but we don't have any listeners anymore. So we don't have any questions. <laughs> but don't worry, we are bringing that back. We're going to reactivate the Facebook group so we can have a place to hang out together. And that's also going to be a fantastic place to drop questions for upcoming Kiss the Goat segments. You can also send us emails at that same old address. The Goat of Madness at gmail.com. Yep, it's still there, and so are we. And for those of you guys that like to leave voicemails, well, we're working on that. We used to have this Google voice number, but they took that away from us like the faceless gifters they are. You'd think technology would make the act of communication easier. It does not. It frustrates me. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for this episode, and there's been a bit of relearning curve with this one, but I think it turned out okay. Yeah, I think so. As always, you can hit us up with suggestions or comments about this here rebooted KTG. Just be nice about it, okay? I'm fucking fragile right now. <laughs> yeah, man. So email, Facebook, what the fuck ever. Let us know what you think. And Bo, dude, Thank you for letting us back into the fun house. And for everybody who's listening, thank you for sticking this episode into your ear holes. It means a lot to us. So until next time, I'm Cootie. My name is X. 
Hail Satan! The new Pazuzu review. I can't do that as well as you. Pazuzu. Pazuzu. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hold your mouth just right. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. I thought it had something to do with testosterone levels. No, no, you just you, you gotta purse your lips. Just, oh. Yeah. Pazuzu. Pazuzu. I don't fucking know, dude. And drink! Every time you just cringe when... Ah, oh, fuck. Hang on. I only came up with two, and so now I'm struggling to come up with another one. Hold on. Just stop, because this is fucked up. How did I fuck this up? That was the climbing into bed oi. Did you want me to do video? <laughs> Not for the show. <laughs> Later, maybe. That'll be, that'll be fine. Good with that. Red Rod. Are you actually getting more booze or are we just waiting? <laughs> I keep getting little pieces as I. <laughs> Try that again. Ice in my larynx. <laughs> Did you just clap for your own mojitos? I'm coming. What? I can't hear any of you. Damn it. I got paid to be on my knees and play in the mud, which have happened to me since my 20s, so. (laughs) Living the dream. (laughs) Okay, I look like a swamp witch right now. Hold on, just stop, because this is fucked up. How did I fuck this up? And that's also going to be a fan pat fan put, hmm? Uh-huh. <laughs> Alright, now see you... Alright. Three, two... Cool. I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs>